Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. And today we kick off with a longer introductory section than usual, which in some ways is a little odd, as of all the places in the British Isles, London is probably the one that needs the least introduction. If you're listening to this, you have heard of London. If you can't place a single village, city or county on a map of the UK, then you have still heard of London. Now, today London doesn't particularly distinguish itself from the hundreds of metropoli that house a quarter of the world's population. Today, big cities are the norm. But that trend, that largely started with London. And the city has carved out a seminal place for itself in the history of humanity. It's an old city, stretching back to the 1st century CE. It has a founding date as a Roman fortress in 47 CE, and it was soon the capital of Roman Britain. And from then on, though its fortune has waxed and waned, it has continued to play an important role, be it under the Romans, Middle Saxons, Mercians, the Kingdom of Wessex, the Danish, the Normans, and finally under English control. As the seat of the English monarchy and hosting the English parliament, and as a key trading city, it's played a critical role in the last thousand years of English and British life. But the influence of London stretches far beyond that. It was the first truly global city, becoming the largest city in the world in the 19th century. Its rise was powered by invention and innovation, global trade, and let us not gloss over this powered also by a vast empire based on slavery, bloody conquest and theft on a historically unprecedented scale from right across the world. Now the relationship between London and the rest of England and the United Kingdom has seemingly contradictory elements to it that persist to this very day. No one could deny that London is at the very heart of English life, the beating heart of production and trade but also the head of the country where decisions are made. What happens in London has determined the fate of the rest of the land. Indeed, in the minds of many across the world, London and England are almost synonymous. And in economic and political terms, there are some truths to that. And yet, London is also a whole world apart from the rest of the country. A dream and a temptation, a place of lust and vice and criminality, but also of hope and opportunity. A place that is other. In the past it's been a vast urban centre in a rural land. A different kind of place, far removed from the experiences of most in the country. For centuries it's been seen as an international hub, a door to the wider world. And in that role and many others, the interests of Londoners are very different from that of the average English person. It's a place within England, and yet not quite English. Even today, the dividing line between those who live in London and those outside of it is stark, emphasised by a huge disparity in property prices. Now, all of this is similar to stories of the urban-rural divide that play out across the world, but in many ways, London was first. Now, of course, talk of all of this can be overplayed, but there is absolutely no doubt that London's waiting in English life, and more pertinently, popular imagination, far outweighs what a simple share of population would suggest. The boroughs and districts of London are themselves famous, and the names of Chelsea, Mayfair, Kensington, Limehouse, Camden, Shoreditch, the West End, and many, many others, are more familiar to many than cities or whole counties in the rest of the country. As the home of many famous writers and early newspapers, where some of the seminal novels and plays of the English language were written and performed, a huge volume of ink has been spilled in descriptions of this city, giving it a paramount place in the imagination of the land. All in all, London has weighed in heavily on global culture in a way that sets it apart from the rest of the United Kingdom. In that city there is the epitome of Englishness, the Queen, And there's the Tower of London, Big Ben, Platform 9 and 3 quarters, which is actually there now. And there's much, much more. 
and yet at one and the same time, it's very different and somehow distant from the rest of England, never mind the other countries of the United Kingdom. It's certainly a special place. It is, as folklorist Steve Roud puts it, the world's most vibrant city. Or, as Stephen Sondheim puts it into the mouth of Sweeney Todd, There's a hole in the world like a great black pit, and it's filled with people who are filled with shit, and the vermin of the world inhabit it, and it goes by the name of London. So by now you're probably thinking, when are we getting to the stories? And we are getting there, I promise. But when it comes to folklore and legends about London, there's a lot of it. And much of it is very, very well known. We've touched upon two pieces already in previous podcast episodes. The mythic founding of the city by Brutus, no not that Brutus, when it was called New Troy, and when we discussed the creature at Barclay Square. The more famous legends about London include the various folklore around the Tower, the fairy tale of Dick Whittington, and the whole industry of Victorian era London stories that are an international cinematic and literary phenomenon. In those tales, spring Jack, Jack the Ripper, and the aforementioned Sweeney Todd interact with much more acknowledgedly fictional characters such as Dracula or Sherlock Holmes. And as their name suggests, urban legends are frequently told of London. I'm not going to get into an involved discussion of the distinction between urban legends and other kinds here, but just to say that these aren't quite folk stories. They're accounts of events that purportedly happened to somebody at some point they didn't. Now I'm not going to tell any of these stories today, though I can't promise not to do so in the future. They're generally incredibly well known, and while this podcast doesn't specifically go for what could be called obscure stories, there are a lot of London tales to go for. But because there are such a wagon load of tales, this episode and the one that follows will just be a very tiny sampling of a vast subject. We're certainly not claiming to be representative of all the many facets of London life. But what these stories have in common is that they share the city, or some part of it, as a player in the story. And so, let's start with an extract from a tale that's popular in the 16th and 17th centuries. That's the 1500s and 1600s, for those of you who, like me, struggle with that whole minus one from the century to get the years business. And so, without further ado, I present to you the life and pranks of Long Meg of Westminster. And to get you into the right mood for the tale, you should know that those pranks are described as Mad Merry Pranks. Our tale starts, as is fairly standard with Tales of London, with a bunch of people from the provinces heading to the city to seek a better life, make a name for themselves, win a fortune, or, as was the case of Meg, to explore the glitz, glamour and excitement of big city living. There were seven of them travelling on horseback from the sleepy backwaters of Lancashire all the way to London. Five of them were women off to find work and money as servants. Being a servant was the Deliveroo or Uber driver type job of the day, perfect for those from out of town. They were led by the carrier, Father Willis. A carrier was a type who made his living ferrying people, messages and goods between London and the rest of the country. And finally, the seventh member of the party was Willis's servant and general odd job man, a surly looking chap. The chatter of the women was excitable, full of nervous anticipation as they went down the coaching road, passing through towns the names of which they'd never heard before, or which they knew was one might a legend. Days of travel, staying in new and exotic inns. And now, now after all that time... I see it! I see it! came the excited cry. London! Their hearts leapt with joy to finally see their prize. Still a distant speck, but not far away now. For a while a great joy overtook the travellers. But as they neared the city, it slowly died away and an air of gloom replaced it. "'What's this, then?' asked Meg. "'We're nearly there. We'll find good mistresses, the lot of us. And it's London, so soon we'll have so much gold, jewellery and fine clothes we won't know what to do with, and fine husbands each to go with it and all.' 
but Meg, Long Meg, as everyone called her, on account of the notable altitude that nature had blessed her with. Well, Meg was apparently the only one who hadn't got the memo. Meg, said a fellow traveller, don't be silly. Before we've got to London, we've got Father Willis to deal with. He's a cruel man, and whatever he said before, he's not to let us go before he's squeezed every bit of money and jewellery out of our purses. <laughs> Much to her friend's consternation, Meg cracked a smile. Him? Right, we'll see about that. Long Meg sat back in her saddle, shaking her head. Look, don't you worry about that. But it seemed as though Meg was wrong to be so confident. For no sooner had they passed by the inns of Islington than Father Willis's horse overtook the rest of them and the man pulled himself up in front of them, halting the ladies. Right, you lot, before you go any further, now's the time to pay up. The women cowered. Apart from Meg. Pay up? she queried. Pay up? But you are bringing us here as a neighbour and good friend. He didn't say anything about payment. Well, I don't know about that, Meg, but I'll be having ten shillings off each one of you, or you ain't going no further at all. Well, father, said Meg, I've got a different offer. More in fitting with how he understood it. How about I give you a good gallon of wine to make you merry, and when any of us should become rich from this city, you can come and find us, and then you shall have some payment. And I'll throw in a kiss from each of us to seal the deal. How is about that? And Meg gave a broad, friendly smile. The other women did some more nervous cowering, afraid as to the trouble that Meg was bringing down upon them, but also quietly delighted at Meg's impotence before the increasingly tomato-shaded face of Father Willis. Ten shillings each, you cheeky wench, or I promise I'll beat it out of you. And at that, he raised his cudgel menacingly. Have it how you want, said Meg. And within a moment, she was up and off her horse, her innocuous-looking walking staff in her hands. As her name suggested, Long Meg towered over Father Willis and his servant. And very quickly, her staff became a large, solid piece of wood moving at great speed towards the father's back. As Willis tumbled to the floor, his servant made for Meg, but he was soon hampered in his approach by the crack of her weapon into his jaw, and down he went. She was subtle, Meg. And it wasn't long before she had not only extracted a promise that all the women would be placed with good mistresses before Willis left the city, but she had also taken from his possession three gold angels, a gold coin worth about ten shillings each, which he offered up totally willingly after being informed that the alternative was a few more beatings with Meg's stout staff. So a little while later, a suitably chastised and much bruised carrier led the wannabe maids to the mistress of the Eagle Inn at Westminster. He knew she wanted a servant, and he was keen to get the women off of his hands as quickly as possible so he could flee the city and forget this whole sorry and embarrassing incident. Over the fields they travelled, for London then was a far more rural place than today, and they arrived at the Eagle Inn to find the mistress of the place engaged in an appropriate activity for one of her station. Some solid late afternoon drinking. She was with three gentlemen, with a variety of titles and a variety of looks. There was Dr. Skelton, who I imagined to be all thin and bony, with a long hooked nose, clutching a small black bag. Next, there was Will Sommers, who, despite his name, looked like one of those generic Caucasian cinematic Chrises. You know, Evans, Pratt, Hemsworth or Pine. And finally, there was the Spanish knight, Sir James of Castile, who was a suave, sexy foreign type, and who may, at some point, have advised his father's murderer to prepare for his demise. Ah, carrier, said the mistress of the eagle. What can we do for you this good day? Well, I've these lasses from Lancashire, my own dear home, and they are looking for work as maids. Perhaps you could consider one of them? Of course, of course. Well, let's have a look at them then. And I tell you what, gentlemen, 
and the mistress at this turned to her companions. Why don't you help me decide? They all of them agreed that this was a great idea, and they turned their chairs to begin the appraisals. The prospective maids were led out, Meg towering above the rest, and as soon as he saw her, Dr Skelton began to smile excitedly. The drink having clearly gone to his head, the man began to prance around, gesturing wildly, a grin upon his face. And far worse, he began to rhyme. Methinks she is of a large length, of a tall pitch and a good strength. Her looks are bonny and blithe, she seems neither liver nor live, but young of age and of a merry visage, fair-faced and of a good size. Therefore, hostess, if ye be wise, once be ruled by me, take this wench to thee. For this is plain, she do more work than twain, I tell thee, hostess, I do not mock, take her in the grey cassock. We can assume there followed a horrified silence, filled only with awkwardness and tumbleweeds. The capering, the sheer awfulness of the metre, made worse by changes in pronunciation over the centuries, meaning that many lines simply don't work anymore. The gleeful sincerity of the man expressing his opinion using verse. It was all just terrible. Finally, the mistress cleared her throat. <clears throat> well, Thank you, Dr. Skelton. What do you think, Will Sommer? Well, asked Will. What is it that you can do, exactly? What was your name? Margaret, said Meg. And I can do but little, merely labour around the house, wash and wring clothes, brew beer, bake bread and cakes, prepare meals, so generally keep a clean and tidy house... And of course I can take quite good care of any ruffians I encounter when engaged upon my business. At this last one, Will Sommer raised a quizzical eyebrow. Indeed. The mistress piped up. Well, as you know, I run a victualling house, or in more modern parlance, a pub. And often we have fine upstanding gentlemen who drink and eat their fill. And yet we find that when they come to make good all that they have consumed, the requisite funds are not forthcoming. Do you really think that this is an area you could assist in? Of course, mistress, said Meg. I assure you that should such a gent not possess the funds to pay, then not only shall I strip him of everything he has in order to sell and make good on his trade, but he would leave your establishment with as many stout blows upon him as a man could take, and learn not to try such tricks again. Four sceptical pairs of eyes turned on Meg. But the carrier and the other maids knew better. The carrier began to explain, but he was silenced, as Sir James of Castile got up. Oh, come now, this is sheer foolishness. She may be tall for a woman, but this is ridiculous. To which I can only imagine Meg replying, quite casually, bring it then. A few minutes later, and the boxing match was beginning. Now Sir James displayed none of that reticence to his lady that so many cocky, soon-to-be-bested male fighters display. And within a moment of the metaphorical bell being rung, he landed a powerful blow on Meg. His fist came in at great speed, struck her, and then... Ow! Ah! ah. Sir James shook his hand, his hand that was now inexplicably in a great deal of pain. As he shook it, he looked at Meg, standing there, a grin on her face. She barely seemed to have registered his mighty punch, and instead she was rolling up her sleeve. And in that moment his confidence evaporated all at once and was replaced by a cold terror but he could do nothing to stop the juggernaut that was Meg's return blow. The small crowd went wild as the bulky body of the knight was smashed into the air before coming to rest on the ground several feet away from Meg. As the other men went to help the poor knight up, the mistress of the eagle turned to Meg. My girl, you're hired. And from that day forth, Long Meg became Long Meg of Westminster, and many more adventures awaited her. (music) 
Now, as I've hinted at, there are several more tales of Long Meg and her hilarious pranks, but I'm not going to go through all of them here. Suffice to say, our pugilistic Lancashire heroine thumps, bashes, smacks and wallops her way through a succession of rude, dishonest and cocky men, including a dishonest vicar, a bailiff, Sir James again, and at one point she goes undercover, disguised as a man with a particularly convincing false name, Cuthbert Currynave. Eventually, she goes on to take on the whole French army, securing her place as a true English hero. Now, if you want to hear more of Long Meg of Westminster, do let me know, and I'll look to do an episode devoted to her merry japes. But for now, we'll move on to discuss another visitor to London, but not one who came voluntarily. Our narrative camera pans forward in time many hundreds of years, illustrated by the hands of a clock whizzing round furiously as the clock face itself subtly changes to reflect the style of the age. And we're well, well out of the 17th century. And in fact, we're at the most recent year that's ever featured on a Tales of the British Isles podcast. 1935. And we turn our attention to another well-established London phenomenon. The Tube. And in particular, our attention is drawn to the abandoned tube station known as British Museum. Now in 1935, the tube station has been closed for two years. If that sounds early for a tube station to have been opened and closed, well, it is. But it had served the museum for over 30 years. But with all the changes to the ever-developing tube network, the nearby Holborn expanded and that made British Museum obsolete. And anyone who had ventured there now would find it an eerie place, dark abandoned platforms lying still, disturbed only by the squeaking of the rats and the distant rumbles of far-off trains. And the people venturing there today were members of the Metropolitan Police, They were accompanied by London Underground staff who had opened up the abandoned station at the request of the Bobbies. For a night previous, two women had gone missing from Holborn Station. They were friends, coming home after a quiet 1930s night out, and they had been seen entering the station. Later on, a man remembered seeing them at the far edge of the platform. And after that... Well, they hadn't been seen since. Perhaps they had somehow fallen onto the tracks, become disorientated, and in their confusion made it to the abandoned British Museum station. It seemed unlikely, but in a case like this it was a policeman's job to be thorough. Flashing their torches around, they saw no women, but sweeping the light across a wall, one constable stopped as he saw something that caught his eye. He bent down for a closer inspection, wiped away the dust from the brickwork, brickwork which was inexplicably covered in a large number of symbols the man didn't recognise. Brightly coloured symbols. Here an eye, here a bird, here men's bodies but with the heads of animals. And as the policeman stared at those strange images, he was suddenly conscious of a gust of wind that started blowing through that abandoned station. A warm breeze full of dust that grew in intensity, so that very soon the little party were covering their face to protect their faces from... It wasn't dust, was it? It was sand. And as the wind howled around them, they became aware of another noise accompanying it. A scream. Not the scream of a victim, but a scream full of power and malice. Terrifying and unearthly. Far above them, in a darkened gallery of the British Museum, was the sarcophagus lid of Princess Amun Ra, all intricately carved with hieroglyphic imagery, which, had he seen it, the constable currently cowering from a supernatural gale beneath the earth would have instantly recognised. Sarcophagus a word which literally translated means flesh-eater. Here refers to a coffin buried many millennia ago in the sands of Egypt and unearthed in the 19th century. 
Once, the sarcophagus would have contained a mummy, a corpse preserved for all time by a process of embalming and tightly wrapped in cloth. But the mummy had been left in Egypt, and only the coffin lid had made it to the British Museum. The British Museum, that grand stone building in Bloomsbury, its imposing columns imitating and exceeding the classical style, housing within it millions of objects from across the world. The first public museum, a treasure trove of human culture, a place that encourages learning, knowledge, understanding of our shared humanity. And of course, it's also a vast trophy cabinet of plundered artefacts, ripped out of their context. The wealth of the world's heritage stolen and shipped to a dark city on a distant, rainy island as evidence of that people's superiority. Which is how something like a sarcophagus lid could end up there. It had been bought in Egypt in the 1870s. There were four of them. Wealthy and brash young travellers, adventurers at a time when Egypt was very much in vogue. They were young and foolish, and they existed in a time before learning from movies would have sent some serious alarm bells ringing. And they found what they thought was the perfect souvenir of their trip. A sarcophagus in a lid, the face of the deceased carved into it. And of course, it was covered in beautiful hieroglyphics that none of them could read. This was a far better souvenir than a saucy seaside postcard and a stick of rock. With money and means, they shipped their unique gift back to England. And within a short time, all of them were dead. Two from shooting incidents. Two from a worse affliction that suddenly overtook them. Poverty. The lid, or mummy board as it became known, made its way into the possession of the sisters of one of the deceased men. She displayed it for a while at her large London townhouse in Portland Place. Now this is not your typical Tales of the British Isles story with a neat narrative. Suffice to say that what happened to the mummy board next was a large number of unlikely and spooky occurrences over many years. Firstly, a photographer friend took an interest in the board and took it away for photographing in his studio in none other than Baker Street. Click, click. Photos taken. A long process to develop them from negatives to plates. But when that process was finally complete, well, where the man expected to see a picture of the wooden sarcophagus, he discovered to his horror and surprise that staring back at him were the eyes of a living woman, her face filled with a dark malevolence. A week later, and he was dead. But despite this, the board was kept in the house for a while thereafter. At least it was so until Madame Blavatsky came to visit. Blavatsky, on whom many books could and have been written, was the famous clairvoyant founder of the Theosophy movement and she is generally exactly what you think of when you imagine a fortune teller. Wrapped in a large black shawl and wearing a long pleated skirt, both of which were embroidered with gold thread and arcane designs, she entered the house with the mummy board in it, and all at once a chill came over her. There was a presence. Something had been disturbed. Something that was out of place, that was angry and that was evil. And Blavatsky, Blavatsky knew who it was. That force was Amun Ra, a princess whose mummy had once lain in the sarcophagus. Somehow, her spirit travelled with the board, not with the mummy. And now, now that spirit was pissed off. What to do with a malevolent spirit bent on revenge? How would the unnamed sister and Blavatsky deal with this? Well, it always looked good to give to charity. And this was exactly the kind of thing that the British Museum loved. You, like me, might wonder whether palming this entire thing off onto somebody else was really the most moral decision. But to be fair, 
none of us have ever been in possession of a haunted sarcophagus from a foreign land, so let's not be too quick to judge. And it seemed to work for the sister, for everywhere the mummy board went, the Princess Amun Ra was sure to go. And so, off the board went to the British Museum, accompanied by its ancient ghostly evil. By this point, whispers of the dark power of the mummy were swirling a certain class of British society. Gentlemen's clubs, the more edgy dinner parties. Tales were told of what was happening at the museum. And then, the press got hold of the tale. A princess of death, screamed one headline. The unlucky mummy, said a more understated one. Soon the incidents began to rack up. The person who carried the board to the museum, dead. The journalist who published a front page story on the mummy, dead. Four years later, definitely connected. British museum photographer who took a picture of the mummy, well, his son hurt his finger on the same day the pictures were taken. Honestly, that, that's, that's his one. Now there could be no doubt of the awful power of it. Strange sounds began to be reported by security guards at night. Staff refused to approach it during the day. Until finally, the notoriously superstitious management of the museum took it off display. They'd not signed up for ancient spirits to wreak revenge for being torn away from their homelands. Why couldn't this pre-modern, pre-Madonna princess just learn to love London like everyone else? And accept her new role in the world without getting so haunty? So, they put her away. Of course, the people who did so were dead within the month. But away she was put, and there she remained, for a little while at least. And now our story snaps forward a few years to a very unexpected place. It's the night of the 15th of April, 1912, and we're in the freezing waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. The hideous noise of human screams and cries punctuates the quiet still of the night. Bodies already float upon the waves, those that have not been dragged down by the ship. Somewhere, Kate Winslet lets Leonardo DiCaprio go, even though there was clearly enough space on that raft for the both of them. And amongst the flotsam, there is a wooden board that has survived for thousands of years, gently bobbing along on the waves. The face of Princess Amun Ra smiles as the curse she reeked down from beyond the grave takes hold. Yep, that's right. The mummy board was on the Titanic and brought about its terrible fate. Apparently, it had been purchased by one of those stereotypically brash Americans who had no fear of the curse. But in a small time, and after many tragedies, he'd seen the error of his ways. And now, he was desperately seeking to ship the board back to England. Now, why it hadn't caused the tragedy on the outbound voyage, I've got no idea. Let's not worry about it too much. The important thing is that it was, of course, retrieved and it ended up back in the British Museum, because apparently they just didn't know when to say no. And that takes us back to where this story started, in the abandoned underground station, and a police investigation. For as that sandstorm whipped around those policemen, they thought they saw something in the haze. A figure from another time. And it is said that she haunts those tunnels to this day, kidnapping unwary commuters from nearby stations and dragging them away to who knows what fate. Now, despite being torn from the tomb by forces outside of her control, it seems that the princess has found her niche in the great tapestry of London life. So yes, all of that is not your typical Tales of the British Isles story. There are many different versions of this tale, and while I'd like to explain the origin of them all, it'd take just as long again to do so. Snopes has a great summary if you want one. 
There is an actual mummy board on which this tale is based, and it can be seen in the British Museum. It is illustrated with fantastic pictures, and the face doesn't suddenly become living when it's photographed. We don't know who it belonged to, though Amun Ra is a god, not a princess, so that bit's just wrong. And now let's move on for one more tale. Leave Edwardian England, the underground, and exotic ghosts of ancient Egypt to go to somewhere a bit more historical and genteel. Let's in fact leave London for a little bit. For the town of Swatham. A town with a name that is pleasing to say, and to pronounce slightly incorrectly, Swatham. Swatham is a small town in Norfolk, about a hundred miles distant from London. But like most small places anywhere in England, the big city and the promises that it offered made their way into the dreams of Swatham's folk. Quite literally in the case of one man. He does have a name, but for the purposes of this tale we'll refer to him as the peddler. For peddling was his profession, such that it could dignify the title of profession. As such, he had no fixed place where he sold his goods, but instead he would move around Swatham and the surrounding towns, harking his wares, accompanied only by his little dog, his ever faithful companion. He sold small things that were not much in demand. He'd carry them around in his pack, and each day he'd lay them out in front of him, a collection of whatever knick-knacks and curios he could get together. Off-brand batteries, yo-yos, ancient compilation CDs and commemoration DVDs, or at least the pre-modern equivalent of that kind of thing. It was a hard life, and he had but a little squalid house, and the landlord was forever taking his meagre earnings. Each day the peddler came back exhausted, and after eating a small meal he would fell down to sleep on a ramshackle bed. And it was there, one day, when he had a dream. A particularly vivid dream. A dream of London Bridge. The bridge across the Thames at that time was, to put it bluntly, a crazy place. The roadway was incredibly narrow, because the whole bridge was packed with buildings, including the famous Nonsuch House, four storeys high. Crossing from one side of the bridge to the other was an arduous journey in itself, and passing through the throngs was enough to test the hardiest of folk, given the mass of people heading one way or another. All of them preyed upon by a great mass of shopkeepers, confidence tricksters, petty thieves and religious proselytizers. It was this mad place that the peddler saw in his dream, an image of a bustling bridge packed with more people than he'd ever met in his whole long life. Now he'd never been to London, and this image might have been scary to some, but to him it called, not because he liked what he saw particularly, but because a feeling was attached to the image. Almost a whispered message. Something was calling to him. If he went to London Bridge, something good would happen. But he woke up the next day, and the memory of the dream soon evaporated with the morning dew. And so he got on with the drudgery of his existence, the only pleasure in his life, his small dog. But the next night, the same dream came again. And on the third night it occurred, well... He was no fool, and if destiny was calling, then he would damn well listen. It wasn't easy travelling such a distance in those days, especially for a man with so little. But he was used to hardship, and he had a few funds that he built up for a rainy day. And so, he used his savings, and he trudged the long road to London, sleeping outside when he needed to, selling what he could on the way. His little dog followed him loyally, and he was glad of its company. And eventually, after many miles and days of walking, he found himself on the bridge. His heart was lifted to see it for it was exactly the same as in his dream, which was surely a sign that there was something more going on than simply a cheese fueled dream repeated. Soon he was standing on that bridge, looking up at the great houses and down at the ships sailing up and down the Thames. It was a hive of activity, exactly how he had pictured it. People rushed around him, this way and that, 
they seemed to be focused only on their own tasks. Perhaps some of them produced quills and pieces of parchment on which they wrote, Ye oldy, sell, 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 before passing the message to a waiting urchin. Such was the way of 15th century yuppies. But the simple peddler had no such purpose. Slowly he paced the bridge, back and forth. He had little to offer to anyone, or for anyone to take, and this was obvious for his manner and his dress. So those around him avoided him. And the day passed without any hint of what the prophecy might have meant. The second day? The second day was as uneventful as the first. The peddler was quickly beginning to get used to the sights, sounds and smells of the big city. But he was alone, and there was nothing for him here. But there had been three dreams, and so he would wait a third day. And this is a legend after all. And so it was on the third day that he found himself standing on the bridge with nothing to do, looking at the busyness of the Thames, still slightly in awe of how grand this place was, but also of how stinky and noisy it was, all so very different from his sleepy hometown of Swatham. The hometown to which it was beginning to look like he'd be returning very soon, his dreams unexplained. He gazed out at the river some more, taking in the sights while he could. At his side sat his dog, well behaved and happy to contemplate after the long walk to the city and the days of wandering the bridge. Now at this point, one of the many shopkeepers on the bridge saw the peddler and his dog. And it's fair to say that this shopkeeper was an interfering busybody of a person. The kind of person who is concerned that everyone else be exactly like them. Who will seek out any deviance from expected behaviour and give friendly advice about just how you should be living your life, just so you're as miserable as they are. You definitely know the kind of person. You can probably even think of someone who fits that bill. Imagine that that person is the shopkeeper. Now he'd resisted the temptation much of the first day, and all of the second. But that guy was here again, doing nothing. That would simply not do. So, are you selling something? Sorry, asked the peddler. Selling something, you know, like everyone else here. The shopkeeper gestured to the mass of hawkers serving the teeming crowds. You see, because if you are, you're not doing a very good job of it, are you? Uh, excuse me? But the man continued on without really hearing the peddler. I've not seen you begging, neither, but you don't look like a wealthy sort. No, I'm not. I've I've got some savings, but they're almost gone. And even if you had money, well, you're still just standing around. And what, pray, is the point of that? You could get off somewhere nice and spend your money. But no, you're just there, standing or pacing back and forth along this bridge. I've seen you. Well, you see, so what's your business here? There was a pause, as the peddler waited to see if the man had finally finished. When he determined he had... The peddler finally replied, Well, sir, if you must know, which for some reason you think you must, I came here because of a dream, and in that dream, I felt that should I come to this place, something good would happen to me. Although now I admit I am slightly less... A dream? A dream? You stand here idly because of a dream? If we all acted on our dreams... (laughs) The man shook his head condescendingly and gave a nasty little laugh. Look, I had a dream just last night that I was in some place I'd never heard of. Swatham! Don't even know if it exists. And I was in the orchard behind some ramshackle old house. And for some reason, I was digging up a great treasure that lay beneath the single oak tree in that orchard. And in so doing, I became mighty rich. Now, do you see me trekking to find this fanciful orchard? Taking time away from my shop and these busy people to waste my life on a dream? Of course not. I'm a practical man. Whereas you, sir, if you don't mind me saying, are a fool to believe in such nonsense. Dreams. Oh, said the peddler. Well, well, thank you, my good man, for your wise advice. I will dilly-dally here no longer, wasting my life away. What a fool I was. Yes, said the shopkeeper, slightly taken aback. 
Yes, you were. Honestly, you've been so helpful to me, I, I can't thank you enough. The peddler even shook the startled man's hand. This had never happened before. The shopkeeper didn't know the script. Um, happy to be of service. Cheerio, said the peddler. And with that he left the bridge, passed through the bustling city and its many suburbs, and soon he was out in the countryside again. And while the journey to London might have been a trudge, the return was nothing of the sort. He practically skipped the hundred miles back to his hometown, barely stopping at all, and his little dog ran excitedly behind him all the way. And when the peddler reached his ramshackle house, the orchard behind it came into view, and he felt even happier than he had when he cast his eyes upon the city of London. Now why exactly someone had long ago buried treasure in that spot, and why they had not returned to retrieve it, we are never given to know. But that had certainly been the case. Truth be told, the peddler felt a bit of a fool. For years he had ignored the huge black X that was duct taped over the ground. But now, he took up his spade, and fervently dug and dug beneath that tree. And it wasn't too long before he discovered it. And you know, he would go to London many, many more times in his life. But in those future journeys he would not go by foot, but in the best carriage that money could buy. Now, although he grew wealthy, he never forgot his roots, and he remained humble and generous with his money. For he gave much to the poor, and gave funds to rebuild the church, which had fallen into a sad decay. So many years later, when the former peddler passed away, he had built a good reputation for himself as a kind and generous man. And so his many friends and fans in Swatham erected a statue of him in the church that he had renovated. The statue is of him as a peddler, pack on his back and a dog by his side. So there we go. The Peddler of Swatham is a surprisingly famous story, and I'm intrigued by what the moral is. I'm tempted to make it a tale about travelling, how it's important to travel and see new places, but also to come back, because what you bring back from that experience lets you find the real treasure that was at home all along. But that's possibly a bit too neat. It could also just be about how you should listen to your dreams. And maybe that's dreams in the sense of desires, but maybe actual dreams. Now, in Swatham today, the town sign commemorates this tale. And in the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, there is a carving of the peddler, his dog, and maybe his wife. But no statue. There are even records that indicate that a man named John Chapman donated to the church. And it is possible that he had come from some lowly birth. So... On the face of it, it seems like there's a pretty strong case for this being some fictionalised account of a real man's rise to wealth. If you go to Swatham today, there are all kinds of businesses that reference the legend, and of course it also crops up in reference to London Bridge. And it's so appealing to find the origins of this story in John Chapman, a real thing giving rise to a folk story. It makes sense, and there seems to be evidence. But what I find fascinating about this is that despite that evidence, the story clearly was not originally about London Bridge and Swatham. Indeed, it's not even originally an English story. Like many of the stories we've discussed, it came from far, far away. Now how can we be sure? Because similar legends are found all over Europe and further afield. In fact, the earliest version we have of this comes from Iran and the writings of Jalal al-Din Rumia. That comes from the 13th century, a couple of hundred years before John Chapman was born. The tale even crops up in the Arabian Nights. This type of tale about a man dreaming of something and then being told about treasure back at home is so common it even has an Arne Thompson reference, 
a way of categorising folk tales, just for that kind of tale. And so it is that a cross-cultural story about the relation between home and foreign places has become rooted in London mythology. An immigrant story, fitting enough for a city that's grown from immigration throughout all its centuries. And suddenly, that's it for today's episode. We had quite enough spiel about London at the start, and I'm not going to repeat it now. This may seem an odd set of stories to pick about London, but given you can fill libraries with them, I make no apologies. And next episode, we'll have some more. About the things that live in the sewers, a money-making scheme gone wrong, and a few of the snippets of folk tales and folklore from the city on the Thames. You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information, including illustrations, asides and recaps, along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members' episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon.